Okay, so I've set up my triangle to three inches between the triangle and the blade because in order to do these, I'm first going to go ahead and shave off this long strip and then that will leave me a section <coughs> that I'll be cutting the bases for the individual houses. Now I want to have a lip around the house that is wider than just what the roof is going to be. And the reasoning for that is because I want the, the base to act as a nice little shield for the house so that uh, we don't have anyone really bumping into it and causing any damage. So let's go ahead and get started. here to allow for the individual houses but you can see it's not a bad cut because this is basically compressed uh, fibers there is a little bit on this edge that will have to be cleaned up but it's nothing that like two seconds worth of sanding won't uh, finish up so I'm gonna go ahead and get on to cutting these and I'll get back with you in the next step okay so I went ahead and cut all the bases took me about uh, six or seven minutes because of the density of this because uh, I wanted to, I was trying to rush um, or not so much rush but just do one cut because when it came time to cutting these in half like this to make the two bases this was actually too wide for my uh, uh, triangle setup <clears throat> So in order to try and get it in one cut instead of having to do like three or four uh, individual free hand cuts, I went ahead and just stacked them up and went it through as one. Now when you do that, it's easy to force the blade. And when you force the blade, it can kind of make it uh, kind of instead of going straight up and down, it kind of bows the blade so that you're not getting an exact straight cut, which is kind of what I had happen. But I had already made sure that I had enough of a lip on these that it wasn't really going to matter. So the worst of them is this one. And if I put it on the straight line, you can see that this isn't exactly straight, but that's okay. Like I said, I took into account, uh, making sure I had enough of a lip on these, that that little bit isn't gonna affect it at all. And by the time it's all finished up, no one's even really gonna notice. Now, I also, um, the clipboards had four of these rounded corners I went ahead and cut a little notch off of each corner here and I'm going to go ahead and start sanding them. So I want to show you another neat little tool that I found. I bought this one online because I couldn't find them locally. Uh, the first one of these that I ever got, I got it at uh, Michael's Crafts. But it's a small handheld orbital sander. The sandpaper is just attached with Velcro. It comes with like eight or ten of them. Uh, the one that I got from Michael's I had never had to actually buy or replace the sandpaper for. You can, if you want to, uh, cut some of the Velcro-backed sandpaper from some of the heavier duty sanding uh, companies. To fit this, you just have to cut out the rectangle. Um, but I haven't had to, and what I'm gonna go ahead and do with these is, I'm gonna go ahead and, we had that little bit of a rough edge on the bottom, so I'm just gonna go ahead and Took care of that little bed on the bottom. 
going to go ahead and do the edge here just to take the, the sharpness off of it so it looks a little nicer. But there you go, four nicely rounded corners. This isn't uh, quite as sharp of a feel, so it'll uh, feel a little nicer on the finished product and look a little nicer. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do these to this stack and then I'll get back to you with the next step. Talk to you in a bit, bye. Okay, so here we are back again. I've gone ahead and put the shingles onto the roofs on all 12 of the houses. Um, let's see. I used a few different sets of shingles because I actually ran out and I'd had some left over from a different project, so we've got a whole selection of different ones. Um, the next step after you put the shingles on is we're going to cover this seam and do some uh, pruning on the sides. So as you can see, this side, because I'm uh, overlapping the shingles, this side is really raggedy. And all we're going to do to correct that is turn the house over because you don't want to cut directly against the uh, piece here that we used for the foundation for the roof because we want to be able to have a little bit of an overhang. So we're going to go ahead and cut right there. Turn it around. Okay, so I've cut this side down. I'm leaving this side a little bit ratty because I want it to look a little, uh, uh, basically a poor person's uh, cottage from the medieval time period. Now if you want to, you can go back with a pair of pewter snips and do a little bit of trimming. And what this does is it gives you an edge uh, to get a little bit more paint build up when you go to the dry brushing stage. You can do that as much as you want or don't want to just to get the final look that you want. Now we're going to go ahead and cover this section up here and to do that we're going to go ahead and use a thin piece of cardstock that I've gone ahead and taken and bent in half into a V. We're just going to set that over it. I've already cut this to size. We're going to glue it down right there. So go ahead and take your glue Helps if the tip isn't all gunked up. Sorry, the glue's taking a minute to get down because I've been using this bottle of glue for the last couple of days to glue all the shingles in place and I haven't bothered refilling it yet. Okay, so one line down the center and then a little bit here on each side. And it doesn't have to be all that terribly great looking because I expect that there's going to be overflow. So take and put that down. Now starting in the center, press down and pull your fingers out. And yeah, you're going to get a little bit of glue on them. Just go ahead and uh, wipe that off. Do it again because we want to make sure that this piece is really well put in place. Um, also, when you're going through this, because the shingles are overlapping in different sizes, you may end up with some that are loose here at the top. Uh, just go ahead and just glue those down as you need to. Um, the next step that we're going to go ahead and do is let these dry. I'm going to go ahead and let these dry for a little bit, and then we'll go ahead and uh, seal them with glue. Um, I've got the bases here. I'm not gluing this down yet, because what I want to do is... Anyone who's done a lot of this, 
depending on what spray paint you use, because I'm going to prime these black, um, I don't really have to black bomb them, but I want to black bomb them just because I want to make sure that they are uh, really well primed. But rather than black bombing them with a uh, brush using acrylic paint, since I've already got all the edges covered, I'm going to go ahead and do one soaking in watered down glue. And I'll show you that here once, I, once this has a chance to dry. I'll be back for that step. Okay, so we're back and ready for the next step. So before I actually go ahead and prime these, I want to go ahead and seal them with glue. And the reason I'm doing this is because even though I don't really need to on these since all the surfaces are pretty well covered that the spray paint could eat into, I'm doing this because there's a lot of cardboard and some wood on this. And depending on what spray paint you're using and how thick it is and uh, the qualities of it, determines how much of it may be soaked up into this. So I've had instances where I have to apply a lot of the primer, uh, mostly because I'm using the cheap 98 cent a can stuff that you get at uh, the big box stores. But it's also because this stuff will soak up some of the paint and so you have to go back over it and over it. And so this is just an easy way to seal this so that that doesn't happen. So I have this uh, Tupperware container. It's two parts water to one part wood glue. I'm just going to go ahead and give it a quick soak. Now you can tell how thin it is because it's running out of the corners. In addition to sealing the surfaces on this, this will also help strengthen them a bit because of all the cardboard uh, edges on the roof. This will help make them a little bit sturdier once that all dries. The capillary action with the super watered down glue will soak up into all the little holes and, cran and nooks and crannies. <laughs> Sorry, still dealing with allergies. Um, but it'll soak up into all those little nooks and crannies and really help uh, seal some of these things in place a little bit better. So what I've done is I have this little red plastic tray. I bought this cooling rack at uh, Dollar Tree for a dollar. I bought the red tray at Dollar Tree for a dollar. So I can essentially just go ahead and do two of these on here. I've got a bigger tray off to the side, but it wouldn't fit on camera. So I wanted to just show you guys this. This is a good alternative to uh, black bombing. If you don't want to sit there with a paintbrush all day, you can just use watered down glue. Again, we're going for mass production, so there. Two of them are now sealed and ready for priming. All I have to do is let it dry. I'll let it dry overnight, and I'll meet you guys back here with the next step. Okay, so we're back. Now the obvious next step is gonna be to glue the, the uh, houses onto the bases. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, because I want these to be as sturdy as possible, and as you'll recall, I went ahead and put in these corner posts in each of them. I'm going to go ahead and put some glue on the corner post. Now right now I'm using wood glue. You don't have to use wood glue, you could use white glue. But I'm just using the wood glue because it's what I have a lot of. Um, I, have, I do have a big jug of white glue, I just haven't uh, put that into the smaller bottles yet. So then I'm going to go ahead and Put it on here now I want to put on quite a bit and I don't I'm not wanting to or I'm not doing that for the the uh, basing yet I'm doing that because I want there to be a lot around the seam of the house so let me adjust the camera angle okay just my little viewfinder okay so I'm going to go ahead and take a craft stick, as you can see, I've got some of the extra glue here on the edge. I'm going to go ahead and push the house down, and this is going to allow the capillary action to suck some of the glue up under the house to make sure that I have a good, strong seam. Now, as you'll notice, I have a little bit of excess here. I'm going to go ahead and go around the house, 
And I can just spread that out. And the reason I'm doing that on the outside of the house is because I don't want the glue to dry in a large bubble at the edge. Um, the edges are going to be covered up once I get to the basing, but I don't want to have a large bubble of glue that I'm going to have to cover up that will make it look unseemly. And the reason I put so much glue down is because I want to make sure that I have a, a nice thick layer, especially on the inside. And the reason I put the glue on the, those four pillars, the way I did is because when I turn the house upside down like this, it's going to drip back down and completely surround them on the inside. So it'll give me a nice tight bond. Okay, so now I have this. Actually, I'm going to push this back just a little bit. Now I still have a nice little lip around the house. I just want a little more space in the front. And you're just visually aligning it. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, go back around it. The reason I'm doing this is because on this one I'm going to go ahead and put a little hedge or something out in front of the door. So I've scooted it back on this side where the door's at. Okay. Now I'm going to set this off to the side to dry. Now I've already done the other houses, so I'll go ahead and get on to the basing. Now basing is pretty straightforward um, because I have the houses here and I want to make sure that I get a good coverage. I'm going to go ahead and put the glue down. Now one of the th problems you can run into is if the glue is a little too thick or you're basing too big of an area it can dry out while you're doing it. So, in order to fix that, I have this bowl of water and a disposable brush. I buy, I buy those big brush packs that you can get at Hobby Lobby or Walmart or uh, Michael's. It's like five or six dollars a bag. I'm not mixing water into the glue. I'm just dampening the brush so that it'll stay moist and the glue that gets into it doesn't dry out. Now I'm not going to worry about going around the sides of these. My biggest concern is going to be the top of it. You want to have a nice thick coat of glue on it. And these don't have to be perfect. I've, I've, uh, I want to talk about that. When you're doing any kind of project like this, it's easy for little uh, mistakes to pop up. Even when you're doing something like I did with a table saw or with a bandsaw, it's easy for little mistakes to pop up. Especially if you're trying to do something for someone else to see because you're trying to plan everything out but it doesn't always work. So don't worry about being perfect. It doesn't have to be. And there are easy ways to fix things as we go along. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on this. This is a little uh, bead tray that I got at Hobby Lobby. It's designed for doing beads and when you're done with the beads you can just pour it out through that hole. Works really good for basing too. Now. I'm going to use different sizes of rocks on the basing. I'm going to start out with my largest one. I'm just going to drop a few here and there. And this is another reason why you want to make sure that the glue doesn't dry out too quickly. 
is because if it does, these the larger rocks will have a harder time sticking. Okay, so I've done a few larger rocks around this. I'm gonna go ahead and go on to some finer ballast. This is an easy step to do and it provides you a lot of visual appeal. Now I'm not going to go ahead and, and rub off any of the rocks or anything that are on the base. I'm going to let those sit. Just trying to get all of the loosest stuff off of it. Oops, if I don't pour that back out on the table. Okay. Sorry, my workspace is a little cramped right now, so I'm making do. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and set that in there. Now I'm going to go ahead and use scenic sand. Now for the scenic sand, I have a big uh, little jar of it here. Here's some more ballast that I have that's brown. It doesn't really matter what color you're using right now. Because this is all going to uh, get painted over. But I'm going to go ahead and take my scenic sand and I'm going to use this little scooper because I want to pile it up on the base. And this uh, scenic sand that I have here is a mixture of the scenic sand and some of the ballast. It's not going to matter that there's more ballast in it. And you don't really want to touch this because of how wet the, the sand is, or the, uh, sorry, the glue. You don't really want to touch the sand because you'll shift things and some of the bigger rocks that we just put down can come loose at this stage. So you want to let them dry as much as possible. Okay, set that down. Okay, now you want to leave this like it is to dry. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, finish up the others. Set this one off to the side for now. But you want to let it dry like that. You don't want to shake off the excess just yet. And if you have a big enough uh, thing of scenic sand, it shouldn't really be a problem. Now something else that I wanted to talk about is different sizes of sand grains that you can get. I use scenic sand because it's uh, got a nice granule size. Let me scoop some of this over. Got one of these things sent to me in the mail a while back. It's one of those where they want you to become a member of some society or their credit cards or whatever. And I find that it's really good when it comes to doing this. Not so much on the mat here, but on my table. Works really well for gathering up some of the small sand. Okay, so let me zoom in. Okay, so you can see the size of the granules of the scenic sand. You can get sand in different sizes of granule, and depending on what you're doing, how, you, how coarse you want it to look, will determine what size you're going to go for. Now, scenic sand is something that I get at a hobby store like Michael's or Hobby Lobby in the sand painting section because people use it to do little sand paintings. But if you go to the dollar store like Dollar Tree, you can get this in their arts and crafts section. And as you can see, the granules in this are a lot bigger than this. But they're smaller than my ballast. 
So it just depends on what you're going for. If you want something uh, doing a hill or something, you probably want to use something like this. Um, if you're doing something like the ground around a house or something in a civilized area where they've done some sort of landscaping, you're going to want to go with something smaller like this. <clears throat> but it's all up to you. Um, but you can look for different uh, courses, coarsenesses of sand. Um, another thing is, uh, as far as sand goes, you can get it at the uh, places like Home Depot where you can buy playground sand. And you can get it fairly cheap in a large bag. The issue I have with playground sand is it's really fine. So it's going to be an issue of what you're looking for on the model. Um, that's all for now. I'll get back to you as soon as I've finished up basing these guys and we'll go on to the next step. Okay, so uh, when we were last talking, I had gone ahead and finished putting them together. And I went ahead and black bombed them. And, or spray bombed them black. I didn't actually black bomb them. Uh, but I spray primed them black uh, because we had put the glue on them in that uh, little tub that I had it went ahead and made sure that none of the foam core is going to be eaten up even if some of the, the uh, edges get exposed somehow so I went ahead and primed it black uh, went ahead and did a base coat in various colors I'm showing you these two particular houses because I base coated them in the same color and as you can see let me zoom in. The base coat is not, I didn't do like a, a pure heavy duty base coat. I want these to look a little bit, uh, not like grimy, but not spanking brand new fresh cottages. I want them to look a little bit old, like they've actually been lived in. Because since this is going to be for a medieval type setup, um, we're talking about a environment where there's no running water. Um, no, no one's going to have really like a garden hose to go out and spray down their house with and uh, clean off all the dirt. So they're going to get a little worn and a little uh, uh, cruddy looking as time goes by. So you can see that there's some little splotches here where you can still see the black through it. And that's perfectly fine because that's what I want. I don't want a nice uniform color over the entire thing. Um, I want them to have some variations. Now, I did a base coat, as I said, of this color. doesn't matter what color you're using. I'm not going to tell you the colors I'm using because I'm actually doing a variety of colors on them since I have 12 of these so that there will be a variety of colors in the uh, village. But I'm, I'm showing you this particular one because I've started on the second step of it, which is going to be dry brushing it in a separate, second color. Um, the colors that I use, I want to go with a darker color for the base coat and I want it to be a little bit grimy looking so I'm not doing a full on heavy duty look or heavy duty coating. Um, this, isn't, this doesn't look good right now because it's not a finished product but when I get these completely finished up they'll look really nice. Um, but I'm showing you this because I want you to see that I'm not doing uh, a super heavy duty coat. So while I'm doing this, actually let me get the paint brush out, widen. While I'm doing this, again, I'm not just like sitting there with a nice super thin paint. Paint's actually a little bit thick, but I'm in actuality I'm not like doing a full coat, it's more of just like a super, super heavy duty dry brush. Because I want little patches of the darker color to show through. And as you'll recall, one of the earlier steps I did was I went ahead and put some sand on the uh, surface before I primed it. So I also get this nice stuccoed texture. And like I said, this is more of like a super, super heavy duty dry brush because I'm going to end up with areas where it's just not going to completely cover it. And as I said, that's really what I want. I want that nice lived in look for my village. Because if the village is too new, you know there's just something evil going on there. Obviously someone rich had to step in. And, uh, it's probably some sort of D&D era Dr. Evil 
type thing going on. After I get done with the, this step on all 12 of them, I'll go ahead and move on to doing the trim. But I really want you to see this step. And if you have patches where it's a little bit too uh, grimy looking, you can always blend it in. Also, I've seen uh, a lot of people post in some of the groups asking about paintbrushes, what paintbrush to buy. And I used to buy those expensive paintbrushes years and years ago. I stopped doing that because unless you take super good care of your brushes, they really don't last all that long. So I've really come to enjoy just using disposable brushes like you buy at Hobby Lobby or Michaels or whatever craft store those big bags of brushes where you get like 20 or 30 different brushes in one bag and this is one of the ones that I got in one of the bags but it's like 20 or 30 different brushes for like five bucks and I am perfectly okay with buying a few of those bags a year because it means that they're brushes that I don't have to worry if they get a little mangled. There is usually, and, and I will look through the uh, bags on the rack, but there's usually some fairly nice detailed brushes. In fact, it's not really a detail brush, but this is one of the ones I got that does smaller patches than this one. Um, trying to find I don't have any up here on my table right now but I've gotten some really nice brushes out of some of those packs and like I said if they get a little messed up I don't really care because I just go out and spend another five bucks and get another bag of them but those bags of brushes that they have with all those varieties of brushes in them at Hobby Lobby and Michaels are an awesome resource Okay, so as you can see here, I've done really heavy dry brushing. I've still got some patches here where you can kind of see the other color bleeding through. And I want that because it'll give a nice darker patch here. Remember, this paint is going to dry darker. So uh, that darker, it, the dark here looks fairly contrasted, but once this dries a little darker, it'll just look kind of more. Uh, like dirty or or uh, lived in um, but I wanted to show you guys this to show you the degree of painting that I'm putting on it because I've seen a lot of people that their their houses and stuff just look like they're a brand new house super nice paint job and everything and I don't see that really fitting the uh, genre and the tabletop because like I said they're not gonna have hoses to go out there and clean them they're probably gonna be fairly tired from working in uh, the fields all day a little spot here I want to touch up um, so going and cleaning the outside of their house it's probably gonna be one of the last things that they're really gonna worry about so once I get all 12 of these done and like I said there's a variety of different colors I'm doing them in once I get all 12 of them done I will pick colors for each one uh, for the trim here and the roof I'll do the trim and roof to match each other and I'll basically just do a uh, 
heavy base coat of whatever color I'm going to use. And I'm not going to do the, the same color on all of them, so some of these will be done in like a midnight blue and then I'll dry brush it with a lighter blue or a uh, burnt umber and dry brush it with a, a lighter burnt umber or a lighter brown. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and do that and I'll get back to you as soon as that steps done. And we are back. Okay, so I have gone ahead and painted up all the cottages. Uh, gave them a variety of different colors of roofs, uh, roof treatments. Uh, granted, I did kind of make a couple of wrong color choices. This one's just a little bit bright for my taste, but I figure, oh well. Uh, but you can see that I've done all the painting, the the trim I just basically did my base tones and then dry brushed it in a lighter color. So here it's navy blue with a regular blue over it. Um, this is a burgundy with a uh, dry brush over that of uh, a little bit of toffee with some burgundy added into it. Um, for the windows what I've done so far is I went ahead and gave them a dark wash inside. They were originally black. I give them a dark wash inside of a true navy from Folk Art. Um, or sorry, wrong bottle. Uh, from Played. Um, but you can see, got some really nice detail. I'll zoom in. Let's see if I can get. Yeah, there you can see it. You can see that nice. Uh, texture that I got from the stuccoing technique of dropping the sand over the dried over the wet glue. Um, I got the texture on all of the sides. For the roof, I went ahead and just did a basic uh, touch up of black. Same thing here because when you're looking at this at gaming height, you will not see that underneath the edges of the tiles because remember, we left just a tiny little bit of an overlap on all four sides. But uh, this is the stage we're at now. There's another one. Now, let me see if I can find it on one of these. Okay, so right here, when you're doing the dry brushing on the edging, um, you're bound to get some little sections here. You can see right here where I've got a little bit too much brown that came through that's fairly dark and it is a line so it's not going to really look good at a distance it's always going to kind of stand out do not worry about that do not go back and touch that up on this um, I will show you shortly how we're going to fix that but right now we are at the windows stage <clears throat> so as you can see what I've got here is a nice dark navy uh, wash that I did over that black it's basically just some watered down true navy that I went ahead and put in there being careful not to get it all over the window sills. What I'm going to go ahead and do now is take some true blue or just regular blue, whatever. True blue is just the name they gave this color, um, but it's just a, a regular basic blue. I'm going to take this brush that I have that's got kind of stiff bristles on it. Yeah, be nice if my hands would work sometimes. Okay, it's got kind of stiff bristles on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dab it into my paint. Got some on the end. I'm going to not pull it off in a dry brush method, but I'm just going to dab it into the cardboard so that I still get plenty of pigment on the brush. I'm not trying to take it off like I would with a dry brush. I'm just dabbing it. Now you can do your windows however you want. Let me zoom back out a bit. But what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to take this and dab it in. These are medieval style windows. They shouldn't really be terribly clean and pristine looking. So I'm just going to dab that in. And when that dries, it'll darken up a little bit. Same thing for this side. Got a little bit on the windowsill. Just lick your fingertip and wipe that off the edging. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and do that on all the houses, and I'll be right back. <laughs> 